that last one though, like really rubs me the wrong way. And I kind of wonder who the arbiters were, who who arbiters or or um or people within the Canadian Chess Federation who lost their minds and and made that ridiculous ruling because that's that's probably the worst that that's right up there with like the worst things I've ever seen, honestly, in ter- in terms of chess. I have to say that it um it really it really is bad, really really bad. Grandmaster legendary icons that stand atop the chess world. They are our chess heroes. These giants are not only our favorite players, but also human. Humans make mistakes both on and off the board, and as a species are also considered cunning, clever, and tricky. Now, whether you guys actually believe that is sort of a matter for debate, whether you think Grandmasters are um, cunning, tricky, and clever, I don't know. Um, but anyway, let's, let's, let's go with the article. Okay. Five dirty tricks used by GM. All right. Actually, let me stop the music too while I, while I cover this article. Um, uh, acting and theat. There are many ways, believe it or not, of acting while playing a game of chess. There are many examples of this that I could use, even one of myself when I was 14. Instead, I'll shine a light on the chess legend GM Miguel Nidor. Aside from his well-known contributions to chess history in the form of one of the most popular chess openings of all time, the Sicilian Nidor is his namesake, he will also be remembered as a bit of a comedian. All right, so I guess it's a picture of Nidorf uh, from 1973. So, second. All right. Okay. There is one story of Nidorf pretending to be ex- exasperated in order to, to, to obtain a draw from his opponent. His opponent. In another story, Nidorf was playing at GM Stevatar Gligorich at the 1952 Olympiad and slapped his forehead after playing 39 Knight Take D3. Oh, he was hoping for he was hoping for knight takes e4 and queen e3 is going to be the trick, I bet. So okay, so he slaps his he slaps his forehead. Oh no, I played knight takes e4, and obviously after knight takes e4 in this position on the board, white goes queen to e3 and is winning. I'm betting that's what he did. Okay. So what do they say? They say uh, Nidor's forehead slapping was meant to portray that he had blundered and overlooked 39 knight takes e4, which Gligorich played immediately and then lost a piece. Here's the finish of the game, starting with Nidorf's antics. Okay, so, so they reach this critical position, this knight d3 position, and black was knight takes e4, queen to e3, and sure enough, black resigns after queen e6 and queen takes e4. Um, so this is a pretty, pretty sneaky one, um, in terms, in, in terms of a way, uh, that, you know, that kind of, you can play, play some of these tricks where your opponent, you basically do something, some antic, and your opponent thinks that you've overlooked something. Slapping your forehead, however, equal, equals a W, that's a bit too much for me. I mean, me personally, I, I, I think that's a little bit too over the top, is, is, is what I would say. Um, so... So it's a little bit, li- little bit, little bit, over, little bit over the top, slapping your forehead. I, I think honestly, if I did that or Magnus did that, we would, we would sort of suspect that our opponent is, um, there's something wrong. Because slapping your head is a little bit too over the top uh, for a blunder. What, what I would say, however, is that I do have something. It's not quite the same. It's similar, um, which is, uh, I don't know if the game actually exists. Let me see if I can open it on a new tab. But there was, there was a game that I played in Las Vegas many years ago um, against Jesse Cry, the American master. Let, let me see if the game is here, but, but let me see if I can pull it up. Um, is it here? Is it 2010? Let me see if this is the right game. No, this is a different game. Um, so I, I, the game's not in the da- database. I'll see if I can find it somewhere later down the road. But there was a game where I played against Jesse Cry where basically I got a position that was very tense. We were in a time scramble. And on move 39 or move 40, I, I made a move that was... It was still my position was very bad, but in in a sense I hung a rook. I did not actually like bang my head, but I did shake my head quite a bit. And Jesse promptly I think took the rook or the queen, whatever it was, and he ended up losing the game because after my after my forty first move, um, we had reached a time control and he had to think for a long time. And he thought for maybe thirty minutes, and then he played like three quick moves and resigned the game. So um, there are ways to do it, but you have to uh, it, it, slapping your head is a little bit a little bit too over the top. Also the reason it's over the top is if we look at this game um very specifically uh in this position after knight d3 knight takes e4 if we go back right um right here even if there's not queen e3 black is only up a pawn and it's not a black actually is not even up a pawn um it's 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 even material so the fact that it's even material after knight takes e4 you would never slap your head like that because you're not losing the game so it's very um 
very poor, uh, very, very poor that Gligorich fell for this move, because if you're slapping your head, that indicates you made a huge blunder, and so what, it's just a pawn, and the material remains even after that, so that's very, um, very poor by, by Gligorich to, uh, to, to have fallen for that, because he really shouldn't fall, fall for it. All right, um, so let's, let's keep going. All right, what, what do we have? Um, according to Gligorich, Nidor slapped his forehead as if realizing he had just made a blunder. I naively fell into the, into the trap and being in time pressure grabbed the pawn, after which Nidor grabbed the whole piece. Even the conservative Paul Karras couldn't stop himself from laughing, and perhaps I would have seen the funny side too, since the bubbly Nidor's childish pranks were, were in a way cute. If it, had been, if it had been me who had just been... Uh, since the bubbly Nidor's childish pranks were in a way cute, if it hadn't been have been me who had just been defeated. All right, so I, I guess yeah, that's that's kind of kind of kind of something that that you'll see. I think in sports these antics may be encouraged sometimes. Sometimes, I mean, again, like I said, I feel like in a position like that, it doesn't it's not indicative of a situation where someone should fall for that trap simply because it's not the end of the world just losing a pawn. But anyway, let's keep going. All right, so whether whether you know Nidor from his world-class days in the 1940s and 1950s or from his line in the Sicilian, you can also know him as a bit of a trickster as well. Dodging matches. Okay, so that, that was the first one, which was just the, the, the antics. So the second one is dodging matches. Dodging matches, or do dodging world championship matches, is something that isn't really an option these days, but it used to be. In the early era of the world championship, the world champion could choose which matches they accepted and which matches they declined. Some world champions seemingly took all the challenge, all the challenges they could, while others, due to various reasons, played a few, played fewer matches as a world champion. In, in an attempt to, in an attempt to fix this issue, the 1922 London Agreement was signed by most of the world's strongest players. Newly crowned world champion Jose Raul Capablanca created this proposal with several specific stipulations that basically said the world champion must accept a match if certain conditions were met. These London Agreement rules were upheld in, 1920, in, in the 1927 World Championship match where Alexander Aliakin became world champion by stunning the chess world when he defeated Capablanca, a player he had never beaten prior to their world championship match. Many plans were made for an Alakin Capablanca rematch, but these talks always fizzled out for one reason or another, with Aliakin staying firm that Capablanca needed to follow the London Agreement rules. However, in 1929, Evan Bogoyubov, uh, however, in 1929, Aliakin played GM Evan Bogoyubov for the World Championship match. Bogoyubov did not have to meet the London Agreement rules, and he was not on the same level as Capablanca. Aliakin won the 1929 match against Bogoyubov e easily. More talks of the Aliak and Capablanca rematch occurred, but still did not prove fruitful. In 1934, Aliakin again played a match with Bogoyubov, and again the London the London Agreement rules were not upheld. And Aliakin Aliakin had no problem defeating Bogoyubov a second time. How frustrating how frustrating would it feel to be in Capablanca's shoes during this time? Getting dodged would not be pleasant. Alright. Okay. In 1935, Aliakin played against GM Max Oiva for the World Championship. Do you think the London Agreement rules were in place? Nope. However, a surprise happened. Aliakin was defeated. In the 1937 Yui Aliakin rematch, also not abiding by the London Agreement rules, Aliakin convincingly won. He would remain world champion until his death in 1946, holding the second longest reign of any world champion, 17 years, despite never giving Capablanca a rematch. Wow. That's pretty funny. Um, both Aliakin and Capablanca were con are considered to be among the top 10 greatest chess players of all time, and are chess legends without a doubt. Having said that, it definitely seems like Aliakin dodged Capablanca after 1930, which to me is just plain dirty. Now, this one I have to agree, you guys, is pretty... Um, this is this is pretty pretty nasty. I, I think um, to a lesser extent they didn't really talk about it closely, but there was a situation um, much more recently, and, and it was only probably for a couple of years. But Kramnik actually dodged dodged playing a rematch against Gary Kasparov. So there are there are multiple examples of it happening um, from the past. So it's not it's not like this is something something that has has just has is, is really relegated to the ancient ancient past. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty bad though. Can you imagine that losing a world championship match and then for the next like 20 years of your life you never get that rematch? It's pretty pretty bad. Um, why can you dodge? 
because I would say that at the time they had different criteria in place. Now, I'm not a chess historian or anything, so I don't know the specifics of the London London Agreement. But what I would say is that I think it's probably where you had where you had to have certain you had to raise certain amount of money. You probably had to be a certain place in the world potentially, but the world champion still had the right to decline. The world champion had the ultimate power, and now the world champion does not. So um, it's a little li little bit different. Um, so so that that's what I would say. All right. Let's let's keep going. So we, we have the next one, which is called clock shenanigans. Okay, so this is this is going to be pretty good. Clock shenanigans. I would guess the vast majority of tournament players reading this have been on one side or the other of the following common occurrence. A player makes a move and forgets to press their clock. Most of the time, the opponent of the player who forgot to press their clock gives a gentle reminder to press the clock or gestures toward the clock. This is the courteous thing to do. However. However, there are many stories of players not choosing the courteous route and instead pretend to think while well, their opponent's time ticked down. Forgetting to pressure clock can happen to anyone, including the legendary GM, Gary Kasparov. Okay, so of course there's a picture of uh, Gary Chess back when he was young, so quite a bit, uh, quite a bit, quite, quite, quite a different time. Anyway, all right. Okay, in the second game of the 1987 World Championship match, Kasparov forgot to press his clock for almost three minutes while his opponent GM Anatoly Karpov sat thinking. By the time Kasparov pressed the clock, he had one minute left to make the remaining 14 moves before the time control. Kasparov ended up losing the game, but to be fair, he was already very low on time in a very difficult position. Uh, very difficult position. Despite playing according to the rules, it is nobody's job but the player themselves to press the clock. What do you think of Karpov's choice to not remind Kasparov to press the clock? Kasparov is certainly not the only player to forget to press his clock in a to press their clock and lose. Former World Championship challenger GM Nigel Short forgot to press his clock and flagged in 2018. So I'm guessing this is a, uh, yeah, this this is a game between Gukesh and Nigel Short where obviously White's in check, so it's White's move, but Nigel ran out of time. Um, so that's that's pretty unfortunate. Okay, so what would you do if, if, a, if, if a GM like Short or Kasparov forgot to press their clock against you and was low on time, would you do the courteous deed and remind them, or would you see this as your only chance of ever defeating a GM and simply forget to remind them to press the clock? Um, so I'll, I wonder, what does chat think about this? Uh, what, what does chat think? Chat thinks it's okay or not? Um, what, what does chat think? The, the, because to me, I'll tell, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what I think, but um, it's okay. Okay, so 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 it looks like most people pretty much think it's it's fine it's fine it's fine not to remind them. I would say that I would never remind my opponent. The fact is, chess is a game. You've played to win the game. I think I think I think um you you just should not uh, you just don't tell them. It's their fault if they if they forget to hit the clock. It's their fault. You just don't remind them. Um, so 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 that that that's what I would say. Uh, is is that you don't do it and um, uh, flag unless I'm winning. Yeah, time is a piece. I would say that I don't think it's really dirty either, though. I mean, many people have many people have done it. It's not like some new thing, and um, so to me, I think this this one is a little bit little bit strange. You can say it's sportsmanship, but it's not on you. It's on your opponent to press the clock, and clock is part of the part of the game. That's the thing. I mean, if, if time didn't really matter, or if there wasn't the main objective of winning the game, then then I would say it makes much more sense. But that is the uh, that is at the end of the day what you do. You play to win, and it's on your opponent. If they forgot to hit their clock, I mean. Why is that? Why is that your fault? It's their fault. Um, have I forgotten to hit the clock? Uh, I wouldn't say I've had a long period where it's, where I've done it, but maybe there might have been some games when I was a little bit younger where I would think for like five or ten seconds at critical moments and that would happen. Um, but in general, it's not a um, it's not something that I, that I've done. Yeah, I mean that that's what I would say. Imagine playing an eight-hour game with a flag and due to due to not pressing the clock. True. Yeah, that's. I mean, to me, it's not. It's not a big deal. I. I think they're they're overdoing this one. Um, the clock hitting the clock is a responsibility of the player. You shouldn't have to teach your opponent the rules of chess. Well, it's not about the rules, but I, I would say in general, I think everyone's had a situation like this where someone gets up, goes and thinks, and and yeah, you you do you do you, you do look like you're thinking and so forth. But let's see what the poll says. Time is a piece. Do it. I wouldn't do it. Let's see what you guys say. How would Gary? How would Gary react if you don't remind him? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, thank you for that too, Hi. Thank you, thank you, my man. Good, good, good comment. Um, anyway, let's see. What is this poll? This poll is sportsmanship or not sportsmanship? That, that's what it, that, that's what it's about. Um, is whether it's good or whether it's bad. Time is a piece. Do it, which means basically don't remind them, or you wouldn't, or you wouldn't do it. I, I think a little bit, little, 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 little bit. Um. L little bit complicated but yeah if you, if you play anything never do it yeah i mean i think it's very uh it's 
you know, there's pluses and minuses to both sides is what I would say. Um, pluses and minuses. So let, let's see. I, I think I think most people are basically saying time is a piece, though, and you you wouldn't do it. So let's keep going with the article. Okay, so that's that's the third one, which is the clock. Okay, subversion. There are many tales of subversion in chess history. Stories of taking a grand, grandmaster second out for drinks and getting them intoxicated so they can't help during adjournments, leaked preparation, team members allegedly giving information to the other camp. There are many examples. In the 1986 Kasparov Karpov World Championship match, Kasparov fired a team member, GM Evgeny Vladimirov, after losing three games in a row. Kasparov accused Vladimirov of giving him information to, to Karpov's camp, though this was never proven. In 2018, GM Fabiano Caruana's opening preparation was accidentally uploaded to YouTube mere hours before his fourth game in the World Championship match with GM Magnus Carlsen. Although the upload wasn't live for very long, it was up long enough for Carlsen's team to catch a glimpse. The details of how his unfortunate accident occurred are still unknown. All right, so that's somewhat true, although that was very minor what was leaked about Fabiano's preparation. It was only a very specific line in the Petrov that was leaked, but let's keep going. The 1978 World Championship match between Karpov and GM Victor Korchnoi was a great battle on the board, on the board. but strange things happening away from the board surrounded this match, surrounding this match are just as noteworthy. Korchnoi had defected from the Soviet Union, which didn't take kindly to their World Championship title being threatened by a defector. Korchnoi's family was stuck in the Soviet Union, was, was, stuck, in the, was stuck in the Soviet Union, Korchnoi had the strange mis had strange mystics as part of his entourage, and Korchnoi accused Karpov's team of sending him secret messages in his yogurt during the games. Yes, you read that correctly. Um, someone want to tell me how that works exactly? How do you um, how how, how do you send uh, how do you send messages in yogurt? Um, I I, I don't I, I don't understand this. I, uh, this is a little bit weird, you guys. Can can you guys tell me how that how that works? I mean, yo yeah, like you're, uh, they're, they're, they're different. The yogurt is different colors, so it's some kind of weird secret code. If, par if part of it is like strawberry, part of it is vanilla, and part of it is chocolate, it's like some code from, 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 uh, fr from the FSB S3 or something, I guess. For six anyway, um, yeah, that's, ki that's kind of weird, kind of weird. It it's probably written on the inside of the container. Okay, maybe, who knows. Anyway, all right. Uh... Korchnoi's claimed that the, the Karpov's team could send messages, could, could send, or claimed the Karpov's team could send signals or codes through what type of yogurt, um, through through what type of yogurt Karpov was given was not ignored. After the complaint, Karpov was required to inform the chief arbiter before the game if he wanted to change the flavor of his yogurt or the time that he received his yogurt. If you ask me, messing with a man's yogurt in the World Championship match is dirty. Um. I don't even know what to say about that. That's so bizarre. Yeah, what are these yogurt stories? I, I don't know. I mean, apparently, apparently this this was the old days. People were pretty insane back then. Um, all right, there is also a wonderful documentary about this fantastic world championship match t titled Closing Gambit that should be viewed by all fans above the age of 12 or so. How Chess has been viewed since Stalin's time as an intellectual tool to demonstrate the, the superiority of communist regime over the decadent West. All the people who were in control in the Soviet Chess Federation were not chess players. They were people from the party, from the KGB. In 1978, Korchnoi and Karpov hated each other. You had the loyal Soviet against the Soviet defector. It wasn't just the ideological battle, it was a major clash of personalities of two people who thought the other one was total scum. The Soviets protect him like he's, you know, like uh, he's a member of the state, well, member of the government, like he's, uh, he's the most important person in the match. In personal relations, sometimes he, he created problems which were not necessary. Karpov was the Iceman, cool, calculated, avoids risk wherever he can. When he came onto the scene, he played with remarkable speed. There was no one like him. Karpov was under a lot of pressure in this match. It would have had big implications for him if he didn't win. I don't know whether he was paid directly by KGB because almost every trip there was somebody from KGB who would accompany him. The leader of the Soviet delegation was the colonel in the KGB. 
He was procurator already who signed the death warrant in Soviet system. The whole Red Army against me. For Victor, chess was everything. It was water, oxygen. And without that, he would probably die. I described him in the Sunday Telegraph as a cantankerous old git. When he was losing the games, he started insulting his opponent. He was a very bad loser. <laughs> they were getting horribly offended at some of the things he said to them, but I thought it was a badge of honor. Chess was always political, but was cautionary in the equation, it became ever more political. It started from the very beginning from the flag, because Soviet delegation demanded that Kushner cannot play down the Swiss flag because he doesn't represent Switzerland. Victor went back to the Soviet side and said, I'll play under the hammer and sickle, but with one caveat, that it says, under the hammer and sickle, I escaped. It's normal for any country who has the world champion to try to protect him. Uh, the question is, uh, with what means? Where Papa refused to shake Kochnoi's hand, it is a perfect example of what the Russians knew about Kochnoi. With all his knowledge of KGB and the, and, and the Soviets, is uh, he still didn't believe they would do that. He wanted months. Victor to play at his very, very best, make him angry, and boy, did they make him angry. <laughs> Hmm, okay, that, that that was pretty good, actually. I, I never saw that movie. Okay, I think that, that that whole match was, like, completely insane. There, there's also a very good video. I don't know if you guys have seen it. There was a, there was also a good video of, um, of a, what was it? Let me see if I can find it here. It was Korchnoi, uh, Korchnoi Polgar. There, there was also a video spe referring to that one other part where, uh, I think most people have seen this video now, but I'll show it one more time. Um, <laughs> I was afraid to lose the respect, but now I have a lose. It is the very first and the very last you ever won the game against me. Uh, I'm okay, sorry. But I won well, it. You won it, you won it. Well, the, the very first and the very last in your life, yeah. Really? One time is also you. <laughs> That was um, pretty pretty bad. As I think I think you guys you guys could hear it. Um, where basically what he says, you know, it's the, the first and last time you'll ever beat me in your life. Um, and, and yeah, yeah, you guys say chill out. He's like 90. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Corcho is like very older. He's like 70, 75 years old, and he's still like he's still like full on like rage, um, rage and chess. Which yeah, it's uh that that is pretty bad at like seven like 70, 75. But anyway, um. Uh, this new setup makes you feel distant from your viewers. It's my new opinion, of course. Dude, I'm just here in St. Louis. I streamed from St. Louis yesterday. I'm streaming here today, and I'm going home tomorrow. Like, you know, seriously. You know, you can type exclam, whatever the command is, and look and find that out, dude. Seriously. Um, anyway, but yeah, that was a uh, that, that was a pretty pretty good video. So, all right, you guys. Um, so let's let's keep going. Okay, hiding hiding a piece. Hi, hiding a piece. I don't mean to single out GM Sam Bator Sambuev, the three-time Grandmaster or the three-time Canadian champion, but an incident involving him and I am Nikolai Noritsyn is the most recent example that I could find of a player hiding a piece needed for promotion by his opponent. In the Blitz playoff for the 2017 Canadian Championship, Noritsyn was in a winning position and about to promote a pawn when this happened. All right, so we've got a lot of YouTube videos. Let's let's watch this on YouTube as well. Okay, looks mm. Oh, this is so bad. Okay, I'll tell you guys what happens. I'll tell you guys before we finish the video. What happens here is this is what's called an illegal move where you put, push a pawn, and the, there wasn't a queen available because what happened is the guy who was playing with the white pieces hid the queen. So there was no queen on the table, so the player with the black pieces could not make a queen because the player, the player who had the white pieces, was holding the black queen in his other hand, and then he put it back on the table afterwards when it when it was an illegal move. That that's that's what happens here. It's a rook. You don't. You, you, you cannot do that. So unfortunately, it's a rook. You understand the principle? It's there, so you put an inverted. Yeah, but it wasn't there. That's the whole point, you guys. The queen was not on the table. If you go back to the start. Yeah, he lost the game because it's technically an illegal move, but the queen was not available. So you can continue. 
And so, or is, actually, they say it's not a legal move. Now they say it's a rook. But but let's let's go back, and I'll I'll show you what happens here. So basically, look at look. Let's go back to the freeze frame, you guys. Go back here. Look at look look at where the queen is. There's no queen on the board here. If we go back 30 seconds, um, there's no queen on the table. You see, because what happens is the player with the white pieces is intentionally holding the queen in his hand. That's what happens. So you see how that you see how there's no queen. And now if you go forward. You'll notice there's there, there's a queen. There's there's a queen. Which, see how the queen's magically on the table now? How is that not cheating? That should have been cheating. Um, see, now they're saying the queen was on the table, but it wasn't on the table. You understand the principle? It's there, so you put an inverted rook, so you're inverted rook. It's not an illegal move, but it's a rook. Yeah, it, it's it's clearly written in the rules. So you can continue. So anyway, yeah, so I mean, so the game goes on, but obviously with it being a rook on the board and white getting a queen, black loses the game. I mean, my personal attitude towards this, I've actually, I, I mean, I remember hearing about this at the time. I didn't really watch it closely, but what should have happened is after the game was finished, the arbiter should have gone back and they should have disqualified the player with the white pieces because what he did was flat out illegal in my opinion. And um, they didn't. Basically, the guy with white got, got the win in the game, but he should have been, he should have been disqualified. Um, he should have been disqualified both from the event and probably, I mean, frankly, should have been banned for some period of time, in my opinion, because that's really, really bad. Um, they said they said it was the response to see if the piece was there. Yeah, the, an appeal was denied. Like I said, the Canadian who, whoever decided this, in the Canadian Canadian Federation is just a moron. That's all. That's all I have to say on the topic because it's very clear what happened here is that the player with the white pieces was just cheating, um, and that's that's all that that's all that needs to be said. Um, so I, I would just I would just say that plain, plain and simple, um, because basically what happens is that I'll give you a better example. Let me see. Um, Nakamura Karawana Queen. Um, let me see if I can find this. I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll show you guys how it normally occurs. So for example, or wait, not not that I blunder my queen. Let's see. Um, one second. Let, let me let me find another one. Um, Toplov. Let's see. Let's see if. Um, yeah. So I'll just pull Bishop this up. Bishop on g3, covering that b8 square. How crucial is that? Naka playing another best move. Rook c1, still losing, but Black has to play. Is that e who I think it is doing the commentary? And try to <laughs> okay. convert two bishops. Oh no! He played e1 without ah! promoting to. Oh so so like for example, anyway, um, I, I think you guys you guys could hear this. Anyway, the, the th thing that I was going to say is that um, basically in this point, what happens is that black pushes the pawn to e1 and makes a queen. Now, the thing is, as, as you'll, uh, I mean, I guess here you can't see it from this angle, but the thing is there are queens to the side of the board. So when they're queens to the side of the board, of course, it's on the player to grab, you know, to get the queen, put it on, put it, get it, then promote the pawn to the queen before hitting their clock. But in the case of that last video that we just watched, um, what you had was you had a situation where the queen was not on the table because the player was hiding the queen in his hand. So that's, that's the thing. Like, you know, it, it happens, it can happen all the time, but when there's, when the pieces are readily available, yes, you can say it's on the player, but when someone's hiding the queen, um, it's just not acceptable period. So, um, so, so that's, that's, that's what I would say, say specifically about, about that previous game. I'm just using, using that as an example, um, to be clear. So, all right, let's go back. So, okay. So then as, as we keep going, it says, it says, as you can see in the video, Sambuev, Sambuev had been holding the black queen that Naritza needed in order to promote properly, but then released it once the arbiter paused the game. When Naritza promoted and could not find the queen, he did what countless players, myself included, have done in casual blitz games. When promoting, he grabbed a rook and flipped it upside down after promoting, which is a universal sign of a queen. Obviously true. Unfortunately, the arbiters say that the promotion was to a rook instead of a queen, and Naritza lost the game that he was clearly leading. So let's keep going. Okay. Sambuev denies that he held the black queen on purpose, but he also could have interceded and told the arbor that he was holding the queen, right? If, if I was holding the queen unintentionally in that situation, I'd have said something to the Arbiter or tournament director. Do you think Sambuev intentionally hid the queen? My favorite quote from the show Futurama comes to mind. All I know is that my gut says maybe. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I have no, I have no problem with giving you, I have no problem with giving you guys a hot take. He, he was, he was, he did it on purpose. He was intentionally hiding the queen. That's all that needs to be said. Um, there's, there's no doubt about it because I'm trying to think as, as I think 
I at no time probably in any game that I've played have I ever have I ever held a queen like you'll see me twiddling pieces all the time like a knight a pawn a bishop any piece um all the time I don't think I've ever ever been twiddling a queen or held a queen in my hand except when you're going to promote promote your own pawn to a queen so the fact the fact is in my opinion it's 100% intentional and he should have been flat out disqualified um that's that's all that's all that's all that uh that's all that needs to be said about it, it was 100% intentional um all right so 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 let's let's keep going conclusion all of these dirty tricks performed by grandmasters share share one thing in common none of them can be performed on chess.com your opponents can't can't hide your captured pieces they can't pretend to blunder at least that you'd see nobody will be getting dodged for a world championship match and none of the above mentioned clock shenanigans can be used against you i hope you enjoyed the stroll through chess history and were amused by some of these dirty tricks what trick do you think is the dirtiest is there a dirty trick that isn't on this list? Let us know in the comments below. I, I think, um, yeah, I think w when I look at these tricks, I'm trying to think which ones can which ones can occur. Like this one, this one at the bottom, I've only seen one time. This 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 idea where you're playing a game and someone hides the queen, they take a piece and hide it intentionally, is something that I don't think I've ever seen in my entire career. So that probably has to be the dirtiest by a big margin. Um, all the others are pretty casual. Worrying worrying about um. You know, subversion or worrying about those things, that's not such a big big deal and it's happened. Um obviously the clock clock shenanigans, that's that's happened quite a few times. It's pretty standard. Um and of course world championship dodging. I think I mean if it could still happen, world championship dodging probably would be the worst. But based on based on the fact that all these other things, I I've definitely heard of all of them before. Um, that last one has to be the worst and it's not even close not not even close in my opinion I think hiding a piece on purpose like that is just by far and away the single worst thing worst thing you can do that that's really really bad really really bad um why is there no Fisher? I'm not sure. Um, have I ever used Dirty Trick, even if not one of these? I've done acting before. I've done plenty of acting during games where, like I said, where you panic, you're like, oh no, I hung something, or your eyes get big, or you do, you know, there, there are many different things that I've done like that, but like, I, I would say that's the only thing. Clock shenanigans has happened to everyone. I've been on one side, I've been on both sides of that, where I forgot to hit my clock, where my opponents have forgotten to hit the clock, but, um, but those sorts of things are pretty standard. Have I kicked my opponent below the table? I don't think so. I actually don't think so. No. No, there might have been one time when, when there was this guy who was really, really tall and his feet were extending on my side, and I think I might have a little bit, but that would be the only, only example uh, that I that I can think of. Um, but otherwise, no. Uh, um, I'm trying to think, what else can happen in a chess game that's really dirty? What else can happen? I mean, you can maybe say staring. I guess you could just say staring, staring at your opponent maybe is something that could happen if you literally just like stare at them nonstop, you know, like this for the whole game, or you just keep staring as, as they're trying to think maybe. But I can't think. I can't think about. Um, I can't think about anything. Anything else really? There, there's nothing else that I can think of. Um, stare to assert dominance. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, blowing smoke into your face. Yeah, so actually, for those of you guys who were playing chess in the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, there was a time when you were allowed to smoke at the chessboard. And I know I know from talking to my stepfather a lot, that there were tournaments he played in where uh, you would play your game, and if your opponent was, was like doing badly, they would just take out, a, take out like a cigar, and they would light it up, and they would just start blowing endless smoke right into your face uh, during the game. So um, I think that was, uh, was something that definitely uh, happened in the old days. Now, of course, you can't do that, obviously. But, but that that is something that happened a lot. That that happened a lot um, in the old days. Is that you would you basically if you're doing badly, you just start smoking and you just there's a ton of smoke in your opponent's face and they can't focus at all. Um, IRL fog of war chess, something like that. Yeah, something like that. But um, I can't I can't think of anything else right off. I I, I don't have I didn't. The, when you talk about acting, the, well, there's only one game that came to my mind, but that game was was a game that was not in any of the Grand Chess Tour events, or there's no footage of it. Um, so that's yeah, that, that's that's about it that I that I would say. Um, in terms of acting, the, the well, there's only one game where I did a really good acting job, and that was when I played Jesse Cry, who actually does stream sometimes. Um, uh, do a fist pump like Fedo say I think everyone's done a fist pump at some point. It just depends on what game it is. So that's not really dirty or anything. Maybe the way that Fedo Seyev did it, it's a little bit questionable. But considering the stakes, how high the stakes were for that game when he did it, I I, I don't really have any big deal with it. Um, but you know, but I would say that like actually I'll, I'll show that for you guys. Let me see if I can find it. Um, Fedo Seyev fist pump, right? Let's see if we can find it. 
Okay, here we go. Let's watch this clip. Okay, let, let me pull it back. Let's let's watch this one. Right, actually, it shows fine here too. So so let me uh, put it here. Oh no, and they've got the sad music with this. Wait, let me let me change the change the video. Yeah, so anyway, um, yeah, I, th I think you guys can see that's like really, really, uh, really, really sad. Like, like really sad, really sad. But like, so, so like the point that I was going to make though about that uh, is that like, again, Fedosev probably should, Fedosev probably should not have, sh should not have, um, have done that objectively, but the stakes were so high in that game that like, it, it makes complete sense. It makes complete sense why Fedosev did that with such high stakes. At the same time, I was going to add that separately, though, you know, Karma has a way of coming back around, and I guarantee you, for Fedosev, thought when he when he when he won that match that he was um, that he was going to uh, basically qualify for the candidates tournament, and so he he was like fist pumping like that. He was really pumped, and then I, I suspect that he was not fist pumping when Magnus promptly won and lost that match at Duda, and Fedosev failed to qualify for the candidates. So you know what goes around, you know what comes around goes around. I guess is the saying. Um, uh as you know but i but i would say overall i don't I, overall i don't have a huge issue with it i think it was just very um i think it was very very just stressful situation for everyone um all right uh so so yeah that that that's just what i want to cover in this article but fist pumping i think in general everyone has done it at some point every everyone has done it so it's not such a huge deal um i should watch the worst chest handshakes i think i i have seen that um you seen the dollar any other athlete fist pumping when an opponent makes an unforced error what's the difference uh the difference is the chess is not quite it's not quite the same i guess as a, as a ma major sport like you, you know you don't have chess games are generally decided on one error it, you know if you look at basketball you look at tennis any number of sports actually basketball and tennis are weird comparisons but you look at like um you look at uh you, you look at tennis there are going to be a lot of moments, critical points that make a difference in a match. It's not going to be like one break of serve generally, um, or one point. So it makes makes a lot more sense. Uh, but in in like a uh, in chess, usually it's like one moment. There's like one blunder is usually what makes a difference. So it's it's really like, I mean, kind of kind of questionable in general. But it it does happen, and, and he's not the only one who's done that. Magnus did that in an online tournament. I think I've done it. Wesley, I'm pretty sure, has done it. Like every everybody's done it at some point. Um, but but it's just one of those sort of unwritten kind of things most of those were fine that last one though like really rubs me the wrong way and i kind of wonder who the arbiters were who who arbiters or, or um or people within the canadian chess federation who lost their minds and, and made that ridiculous ruling because that's that's probably the worst that that's right up there with like the worst things i've ever seen honestly in, ter in terms of chess i have to say that it um it really it really is bad really really bad did I learn any dirty trick today that you can use for a future game? Nah, I mean, that's... No, because the thing is, I can tell you guys, like, as I think about it, there's no way that's accidental because I've twiddled pieces. Maybe someone's done a montage of it, but if most of you guys have watched me play play over-the-board chess, I usually am twiddling, like, a pawn or I'm, I'm twiddling something when, when, I, when I'm playing the game of chess. I don't think ever in my entire life I've ever been twiddling a queen. And the only way you can be... You could even have a queen in your hands is if you twiddle the pieces, but the queen is also way too big relative to, like, a pawn or a knight or anything else. So, um, yeah, it's just impossible. There's just no chance. No chance of that ever. Why would they think it's a promotion to a rook if it's upside down? You'd never promote to a rook to a queen. Well, because of what they try to claim is they they claim that he 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 basically took the pawn and turned it into a queen. Now, if you play casual blitz chess, um, as everybody knows, in many cases you don't have two queens at the board. So, like if you have one queen on a board, you take the pawn, you put it on the back, you turn it to an upside down rook, and that becomes a queen. So the thing is, he couldn't find the queen, so he basically he found the next closest thing and he turned the pawn into the upside down rook, which everyone knows would be a queen. But then the arbiters claimed that the queen was on the table uh, when it was not on the table. Very clearly and so he had to make a rook is what they said um but yeah it's just like i mean the whole thing is stupid the, yeah i mean the, the whole thing is just insane can i twirl something else like a spinner <laughs> yeah funny um 
But yeah, that, that's that's what I would say. If, if I'm playing a tournament and there's no second queen, what should I do? Uh, if there's a board nearby, you should grab a queen. If there isn't a board nearby, probably again, you take the pawn, you turn it into an upside down rook to make the queen. Like, that's the thing. So, I mean, I, I would just say, though, it's very, very bad. Is there a rule that you have to promote um, if you if you want to pawn the back rank? Well, you, you have to promote to something. Yes, those are the rules of chess. Uh, but why don't they have three extra queens? Because normally, nor normally, you guys, when you play a tournament, you go by X number of sets, and um, you go go by X number of sets, and 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 then the, they don't provide an extra queen. So you play a tournament, the organizer goes by twenty sets. That's on the board makers, because usually the board makers don't provide a spare queen. Is is, is what I would say. Um, I mean, probably what you're supposed to do technically is you're supposed to stop the clock and call an arbiter, but in the heat of the moment, that almost never happens, is what I would say. O almost never. Um, uh, carry, carry an extra queen with you in your pocket, that would be quite different, shall we say. Uh, quite different. But, but anyway, um, yeah, just have that, have that spare queen in your pocket, right?